let's get on with the message this morning. So, we are in the book of Leviticus, and um, we have two more Sundays, today and one more week in Leviticus, and then we will we'll be done with Leviticus. Um, the title of the message today, I, I have actually, I, I had two titles for it. The, for the initial title that I had for it was this, The Fall Feasts and the Return of Jesus. All right, but I thought that's kind of, it's very descriptive, but kind of boring. So this is the actual title, the new title, Shofar So Good. <laughs> I like that better. Subtitle, The Fall Feasts and the Return of Jesus. Okay, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but when, when I, when I uh, scroll through, like, the news uh, on my phone or I'm watching something on TV, the news, like, it's, it's almost all terrible, yeah? It's like bad news, um, and it's, it's almost overwhelming at times to see how much trouble there is in the world, and um, it's just one terrible thing after another, it feels like. It can be very depressing and discouraging, um, but one of the things that, um, that I, I think is pretty great about being a Christian and, and our faith in God is that we have hope. We have hope for our broken world. We have hope uh, because we know that Jesus is coming back one day and that he has a plan to heal and restore, to fix this planet and set everything right again. That gives us great hope. Um, at the very end of the Bible, Jesus leaves us with this statement. He says, I am coming soon. Oh, <laughs> that's good. And there's a lot in the New Testament about the return of Jesus. We're not going to go over it all this morning. I have preached about this actually somewhat frequently uh, recently. Um, and even in January, I did the message on the great gig in the sky and all that. But just a, a few key passages I want to remind us of just so we understand sort of the general sweep of the Bible's teaching on Jesus' second coming. So if we start in Acts chapter 1. So let's just say, what does, the, what does the New Testament in general teach about the second coming of Christ? So Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 6 to 11. <clears throat> when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom. He replied, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So we know Jesus is coming back. This is only one of many passages that tell us this. He will return in the same way they saw him go when he ascended into heaven. He will return. We also know that when he does return, there will be a resurrection a resurrection of the dead. John chapter 5. It says, Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. There will be a resurrection. A resurrection of the dead. Then 1 Thessalonians 4 gives us a little more detail tells us the order of the resurrection. We won't read that, but it tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first. So anyone who is dead when Christ returns, they will rise from the dead. And then anyone who is alive, who is a Christian, when Christ returns, we will rise to meet him in the air. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us this, verses 22 and onward. It says, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised at the first of the harvest. We talked about that last week. He was the first fruits. Okay, he was the first fruits, the first of the harvest. And then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. So there will be Christ returns. There's this resurrection and then the end will come. What does the end entail? The end entails judgment. Matthew 13 gives us a little bit about this. 39 to 43. 
The enemy who planted uh, the weeds among the wheat is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. There will be a sorting that takes place. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Anyone who with ears to hear should listen and understand. So there will be the return of Christ. There will be a resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then all who are alive will also rise. And then the end will come, which entails a judgment, a sorting out of those who belong to Christ and those who do not. And then the final states. Okay, so that's the general sweep of what is going to happen. Now, there's much speculation and disagreement among Christians about the details of all of that. When is Jesus coming back? Is it going to be really soon because of all the stuff happening in the news? Or will it be thousands of years from now? Who knows? Will Jesus' return happen all at once, or will it be in stages? Will there be a thousand-year gap before the final heaven? Will we live through a period of tribulation, or will the church be raptured out? Will things get worse and worse before Jesus returns, or will they keep getting better and better until Jesus finally returns? There's, we could spend days. There have been myriads of books written that debate all of these details. But the three main things that are going to happen, as we've said, are this. There will be a resurrection, and then there will be judgment and then the final states, the new heaven and the new earth. For the most part, these are the accepted facts of the church, regardless of whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill, Zionist, dispensationalist, futurist, partial preterist, cat lover, dog lover, vegetarian, whatever. (laughs) And if we wanted to sum it up even more simply, we might just say this. One day... We don't know when. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to fix the planet. God is going to heal his creation, and those who belong to Christ will enjoy him forever. Praise the Lord. Now, as we look at the book of Leviticus today, continuing our series, we're going to be reminded that way back when God first gave Israel their law, 1,500 years before Jesus was born, God designed the law to point to Jesus, to point ahead to the coming Messiah, and even to foreshadow his second coming. We talked about this last week. We talked about how the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. Jesus is on every page. And one example of this we started looking at last Sunday is how the Hebrew calendar, as outlined in Leviticus 23, points to Jesus. This is a reminder There are these seven feasts that God gave the nation of Israel in Leviticus 23 to celebrate annually. In the spring, there is the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And then 50 days later is the Pentecost. And then in the fall, there are these other feasts. And we're going to talk about those today. Um, Let's just, if you go to the next uh, image there, um, the background, if you can make the background lighter real quick so we can see the text that's there, that would be helpful. Um, but those, those first three that I have in green there, those are the spring feasts, okay? And they, it's ama- amazingly, they, they line up with the events of Easter weekend. So Jesus died on Passover as the Passover lamb that, that covers us uh, from the judgment of God the blood of Christ. And then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which, which starts the next day. And Jesus, on that day, his body uh, was in the tomb. And, and the unleavened bread we talked about last week, the, the matzah bread, really perfectly represents the body of Jesus. So his body is broken and in the tomb on the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the very next day is the Feast of first fruits, And that is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, as the first fruits of a great resurrection to come, as we just read in 1 Corinthians 15. And then, uh, the 50 days later is when uh, Pentecost is, or the Feast of Weeks. And that is the day that the church was born. The Holy Spirit was given to the church on the day of Pentecost. You can read that in Acts chapter 2. So we have this uh, really amazing fulfillment of things in the past that happened in those first four feasts. 
And then we have these three more feasts, festivals, celebrations, holy days that come in the fall. And the first, that's what we're going to look at today. And they foreshadow the return of Jesus, things that haven't happened yet. So the first one is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. You can go to the next slide, please. All right, so the Feast of Trumpets happens on the month of Tishri, the first day. And Leviticus 23 is where we are. If you have your Bible, you can turn there, Leviticus 23, starting at verse 23. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. On the first day of the appointed month in early autumn, that's Tishri, you are to observe a day of complete rest. It will be an official day for holy assembly, a day commemorated with loud blasts of a trumpet. You must do no ordinary work on that day. Instead, you are to present special gifts to the Lord. Okay, so it's known as the Feast of Trumpets. Because on that day, there's this loud, these loud blasts of the trumpet. <clears throat> um, it is on the first day of the appointed month in early autumn. A more literal translation would say the first day of the seventh month, which is Tishri 1. This is actually considered a New Year's Day for Israel. And they have multiple New Year's Days. This is one of them. Uh, and they, they, yeah, they actually celebrate four New Year's Days over the course of the year. The Hebrew name for the Feast of Trumpets is Rosh Hashanah. You may have heard that. Rosh Hashanah, which means literally head of the year or, or beginning of the year. <clears throat> but known here in Leviticus 23 is the festival of trumpets. And God said to give loud blasts of a trumpet. And on this day to this day in Israel, loud uh, trumpets are blown many times. But not what you might think when you think of the word trumpet, okay? Their trumpet that they would have used then and still use today is the shofar. It's a ram's horn. And actually, I want to play this video clip. Hopefully, that uh, translated into the... Uh, do you have the, the video of the ram's horn? There was an MP4. Oh, darn. It didn't, tra it didn't uh, import or... No? Did you try? <laughs> oh, if you find it, maybe we can find it quick. It, in the Google Drive, sorry, we should have reviewed this before. In the Google Drive, there's an MP4 video. If you want to just open that up quick and play it, because I really think you... I want to give you the experience of hearing what this shofar sounds like. You probably have heard it before. If you've ever gone to any like uh, charismatic worship convention, there's probably somebody blowing a, a shofar in the back, declaring, you know, something, uh, some prophecy or something. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, this, it's literally a ram's horn that they blow into and they, and they can get this cool sound. Do we have it yet? No. Google's not working. Oh, no. Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe I can. Okay, here. We'll do it this way. We're going to do this real quick because I really want you to hear this. Google Drive. Here we go. Patience. Oh, where is it? I don't see it now. It's not even there, is it? No, it's not. Just search it on YouTube. Okay. It's not, it, it was there last night. It's not there now. It disappeared. Okay, well, I don't even know where it is on YouTube. Just imitate it. Yeah, imitate it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Sh yeah, yeah, okay. Eight hours nonstop of shofar blowing. That sounds good. Eight hours nonstop powerful sound of shofar blowing spiritual warfare. Okay. No, that's a shofar, but that's not, they're really doing some different sounds with that. Usually it's more of just like a kind of thing. Anyway, um, it's too bad that we, you're welcome. It's too bad we couldn't get that. I, I don't know what techn, technology, we'll blame technology. It's not, certainly not Elizabeth's fault. That's, don't blame Elizabeth. We love you, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, okay, what's the symbolism of all this? Well, um, there's a few things that are symbolized by the, the blowing of the shofar. 
And it's important, I think, for us to understand the coming of Christ. So the next slide, yeah. So it means, it's used for a few things. First of all, a wake-up call. Um, and on the day of Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, the, the images that you're supposed to wake from your spiritual slumber. So if you've been, if you've been spiritually in a rut, or you've been in a, in, a, in a habit of sin, or a pattern of sin, this is a wake-up call. It's supposed to blast you from your, your slumber, to repent of sin and turn back to God, uh, and, and to prepare your hearts for the Day of Atonement, which is the day of, of this sort of, uh, of sacrifices for sin and all that. Uh, so it's, it's to prepare your heart to, to wake up and to, towards repentance. And then a shofar is also a rallying cry. The shofars were used to bring people together from, from the fields, right? This is a fall uh, festival, uh, so they, they would uh, blow the shofar to say, it's time to celebrate, and everyone would come in from the fields and sca- uh, gather from all the places where they've been scattered uh, and brought together as one again. And then it's also used to announce the king, the coming of a king. The king has arrived, blow the shofar. Um, and a religious application is, is, is a declaration of the kingship of God. Blowing the shofar is to say that God is the king. And the Feast of Trumpets is the day of the coronation of God as the king on earth. So this is all the pre-Jesus Jewish understanding of the shofar. But it's pretty cool how clearly it points to Jesus. In multiple places, the, uh, the Bible describes the return of Jesus being accompanied with the blast of the shofar trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise in, in 1 Corinthians 15. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. That's the shofar. In Matthew 24, And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds. And the elect are those who belong to Christ. And just like the shofar blew on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, to gather in scattered people from the fields, so shall the church, when Christ returns, be gathered together again, living and dead, those engaged in the work of the harvest and those who were previously engaged in the work of the harvest. We will, we will be gathered together. It's a wake-up call. And we will see Christ appear. And if these p- p- passages are meant literally, then there will, uh, we will hear the blast of shofars and the dead in Christ shall rise. They will awake from their slumber. And all of us will rise to meet him in the air and be changed. And then we will cease from labor, and we will welcome the king as the day of his coronation as king on earth comes to realization. Clearly, the New Testament is telling us that the Feast of Trumpets foreshadows the second coming of Christ. All right, so that's the first of these fall festivals. So clearly uh, a foreshadowing of Christ. Then the second fall festival is the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 23, 26 to 32. Then the Lord said to Moses, Be careful to celebrate the Day of Atonement on the tenth day of that same month, nine days after the Festival of Trumpets. You must observe it as an official day for holy assembly, a day to deny yourselves and present Special gifts to the Lord. Do not work during that entire day because it is the Day of Atonement when offerings of purification are made for you, making you right with the Lord your God. Verse 29. All who do not deny themselves that day will be cut off from God's people, and I will destroy anyone among you who does any work on that day. You must not do any work at all. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live This will be a Sabbath day of complete rest for you, and on that day you must deny yourselves. This day of rest will begin at sundown on the ninth day of the month and extend until sundown on the tenth day. Now, we've already spent two sermons, actually, on the Day of Atonement in this series, so we're not going to go over it all again. But I want to remind you of the main event on the Day of Atonement, which is when these two goats are taken. You remember this? One goat is sacrificed for the forgiveness of the sins of the nation, and the other goat uh, is sent out into the wilderness as the scapegoat. And the, and the sins of the nation of Israel are, are symbolically placed on this goat. And then he's given the boot and sent out into the wilderness. Uh, and it, it symbolizes the, not only the forgiveness of sin, but the removal of sin from the people. 
It's not just that God forgives our sins, but he removes our sins from us. He expiates our sin. It's gone. We are purified. So, of course, this foreshadows Jesus in many ways. He perfectly fulfilled the Day of Atonement in every way at his death. He makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven and for our sins to be forgotten, removed from us, so that when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin, but he sees the holiness of his Son. But we still commit sins. There is still leaven in those loaves. Remember last Sunday, the two loaves on the day of Pentecost that are leavened because there is still sin in us. Who in this room will admit That even though you've been saved, even though you love Jesus, you still commit sins. You guys are awful. (laughs) Terrible church. Everybody raised their hand. Oh, it's true. Yes, all of us sin. We, We continue to sin. Not only does the Day of Atonement obviously point to Jesus' completed work on the cross, it also points forward to when Jesus comes back, because at that time, there is going to be the ultimate, final, once and for all, complete removal of sin from the world. That's the ultimate day of atonement. We read in, the, in Revelation 20 about the final judgment. I'm not going to read all of that for the sake of time, but it says that all things that are evil and sinful and everything are cast into the lake of fire and destroyed. Which sounds like bad news, but it's good news. It means that all evil is finally eliminated. All wickedness that, that destroys our world, all violence, all hatred, everything is finally eliminated and erased. That's the best news. <clears throat> the Day of Atonement, which focuses on the removal of sin uh, from the nation of Israel, foreshadows the second coming of Christ when all sin will be removed once and for all, completely, from the entire world. And then after this solemn day of atonement comes the joyous Feast of Tabernacles. This is also known as the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot in the Hebrew. Let me read this. So this this is a very, this is the celebration Verse 33 of Leviticus 23. And the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Begin celebrating the festival of shelters, or the festival of booths, uh, or tabernacles, on the 15th day of the appointed month, five days after the Day of Atonement. This festival to the Lord will last for seven days. On the first day of the festival, you must proclaim an official day for holy assembly when you do no ordinary work. For seven days you must present special gifts to the Lord. The eighth day is another holy day on which you present your special gifts to the Lord. And this will be a solemn occasion and no ordinary work may be done on that day. Uh, I didn't mean to read all that. Verse 39. Remember that this seven-day festival to the Lord, the festival of shelters, begins on the 15th day of the appointed month after you have harvested all the produce of the land. The first day and eighth day of the festival will be days of complete rest. On the first day, gather branches from magnificent trees, palm fronds, boughs from leafy trees, and willows that grow by the streams. And then celebrate with joy before the Lord, your God, for seven days. You must observe this festival to the Lord for seven days every year. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed in the appointed month from generation to generation. For seven days, you must live outside in little shelters. A native-born Israelite, All native-born Israelites must live in shelters. This will remind each new generation of Israelites that I made their ancestors live in shelters when I rescued them from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses gave the Israelites these instructions regarding the annual festivals of the Lord. All right. A lot of text in there. We don't need to know all those details. Um, But in this celebration, which Jewish people still celebrate, the Feast of Tabernacles, they construct booths outside, and they spend most of seven days living in these little booths, or sukkahs, as they call them. Uh, here's some pictures of what they look like. So here's a tr- more of a traditional sukkah in Israel. And the, 
Roofs are intentionally, they're made of these branches and they're intentionally not rainproof uh, so that uh, the elements can come in. This is part of the idea behind it. Here's another image. This is what in modern, you know, they've got their apartments and their balconies and they're putting their sukkahs on their balconies so they can live outside for seven days. And you can even go on Amazon for $1,200 and buy a kit. Yeah, the next one. There it is. Yeah, that's a sukkah kit, $1,200 on Amazon. <laughs> that's the modern. That's for the, the, yeah, that's for the contemporary Jew. All right. <clears throat> The purpose of this is to remember when they lived in the desert, when they didn't have houses, and they were forced to live in these little huts before they went into the promised land. Um, And reminds them to rely on God's provision and protection. God's provision and protection. At nighttime, we go into our insulated homes, and we, we lock our doors, and we go to bed. And we're not relying on God to protect us from the elements and our enemies. When we go to bed at night, we're relying on the safety of our homes. Uh, but that, the part of the point of this experience is uh, in this unprotected booth with a roof that lets in the rain, it's a reminder to rely on God's protection and provision, just like the Israelites did before they went into the Promised Land. Unlike the Day of Atonement and other Jewish feasts, Tabernacles is a truly joyful celebration at the end of the harvest season. If, if, if the Day of Atonement is the most solemn, then Tabernacles is the most joyous. And it foreshadows Jesus. In John 1, it says that Jesus took on flesh and tabernacled among us. He tabernacled. He, he took up residence among us for about 33 years. Then he died, and he rose from the grave and went back to heaven. The Feast of Tabernacles points to the future day when he will permanently tabernacle with us. In Revelation 21, verse 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And that dwelling place is literally the word tabernacle. The tabernacle of God is with man. He will tabernacle with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He is going to join us in a sort of permanent Tabern- Feast of Tabernacles. Just like God moved into the tabernacle way back at the end of the book of Exodus. If you remember, the very first message in the Leviticus series was called When God Moves In. We talked about how at the very end of Exodus, God moved into the tabernacle. And then they lived with God, the holiness of God in the middle of their, in, in the middle of their community. That's what it's going to be forever on a massive global scale when Christ returns. He will tabernacle with us. The temple of God will be in the, he will be in the center of the city and we will tabernacle with him. Uh, and, and he said, in, in my father's house are many rooms. Uh, I go and prepare a place for you, a room. There's a room for you in this beautiful reality if you know Christ. And so 2,000 years ago, he took on flesh and tabernacled among us. And in the future, he will tabernacle amongst us again. And we will live in the presence of God with no more curse or taint of sin. We will totally and completely rely on God's protection and provision for eternity. It will be a permanent feast of tabernacles. And that, my friends, will be a joyful celebration. And if Nova was here, she'd be shouting amen, hallelujah. But she's not, so someone else needs to do it. Oh, she was earlier online. Was she shouting amen in the text? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) that's great all right so we've got these fall feasts that all point to Jesus let's review now let's summarize okay so we've got uh, the spring feasts the Passover the unleavened bread the first fruits which which point to things that Jesus has done in the past and we have the the feast of weeks or Pentecost which points to the birth of the church and we are in this church age now this age of harvest while we wait for the fall feasts, while we wait for Christ to return, the Feast of Trumpets, when the resurrection of the dead will happen, the, this, we are awoken from our slumber, we are gathered together, the resurrection takes place when Christ returns. And then there is the Day of Atonement, the solemn day of judgment when sin is removed. Uh, and then we have the joyous Feast of Tabernacles, which represents the new heaven and the new earth when Jesus tabernacles with us forever and ever and ever. You see those three events perfectly 
described, perfectly illustrated by these fall feasts way back in Leviticus 23. Now, don't tell me Leviticus is boring when you look at that and you go, that is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So the Feast of Trumpets, the scattered people will be gathered. The Day of Atonement, the sinful planet will be cleansed and tabernacles, the soaring people will rejoice. Don't miss it. Don't miss out on this great day when Christ returns. Be ready. Be ready by trusting in Christ as your Savior today if you never have before. When I, when I was in uh, maybe junior high or high school, I don't remember exactly when it was, uh, I had a dream. And it was one of those, I, I don't have dreams very often that are, you know, anything except some weird thing from my imagination that doesn't make any sense. I dream all the time. Usually they're very insignificant, pointless, bizarre things. But this was one of those dreams that is like, this is like, God is speaking to me in this dream. And uh, in my dream, I was, I was uh, coming home from school, I was, and I was, uh, had my backpack, I remember, and I was walking up the steps into my house, and I heard the, the sound of trumpets, this huge, loud, the whole, like, everything was sounding of the shofar, and, and, I, and I looked up into the sky above my house, and it was all bright, and this dream was a dream of the second coming of Christ. And that was where the dream ended. Uh, and I woke up going, thinking, whoa, Jesus really could come back at any moment when we're not expecting it, when we're just going about our normal day, coming home from school, going to work, eating lunch, whatever. Christ could come back at any time. And I asked myself in that moment, am I ready? Am I ready for that? Am I prepared? Am I living as if? I'm ready for that return of Christ. It was a, it was a moment for me. Um, and I, I believe I was ready in that I trusted in Christ as my Savior when I was a, a young boy. Um, I was ready not because of anything really that I've done, but because Jesus has saved me. And we can have that assurance. We can have that peace. We can have confidence in that hope when it comes to the future. In Romans, it says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. 